Hey, thanks for joining us, everyone uh, here in Chanhassen, those that are online, those that are at Bush Lake and West Tonka, and however you're joining us, maybe be one together. What a great time to come and worship the Lord. And uh, let me just level set where we were last week as we opened up this new series. First of all, I identified that the 2024 goal, summed up in one word, is Christ-likeness that we want to grow throughout the course of the year to be more like Christ, to love more like Christ. So I gave an invitation, wherever you are in your journey of faith, take a next step and grow it. Take a next step to grow your faith. So if you don't have faith, take the next step and discover how it is you could come to faith. Or if you are a bit deadpan in your faith, it's just you, you're nominal in your faith and you want to come alive, take that next step and we're going to give tools for that. Or perhaps you are alive in Christ. Continue to grow in grace and truth. That is the goal for 2024 and that is the invitation. The series that we're going through is Colossians and uh, it's a, just a short little book. It's just four chapters, 95 verses, that's all. And it is, uh, it is a, a book that is uh, compelling because it, it takes 13 minutes to read. And so I challenged you last week to try to read Colossians through at least one time a week. But you could read it 12 times in the length of a football game. And if you did that, you would begin to saturate your mind with the beauty of this incredible letter called the Colossians. It's such an important one in, in our journey. So we'll be doing this over the next eight weeks. And then the, the title that I've given for each of the weeks that we're in Colossians is simply this. I come alive when fill in the blank because Paul brings you know, uh, an eight layer cake to these eight weeks of the things that make us come alive. He's writing to this church that is indeed alive, and he calls us to move into that given arena. That's what we intend to do. Today, I would fill it in. We're looking at Colossians um, chapter um, 1, verses 1 through, or or 15 through 23, and I would fill in that that blank to say it's, uh, I come alive when I know who Jesus is. So when you know who Jesus is, I promise you, you will come alive. You will come alive. And so last week, I also level set the theme word for the year. And the theme word is, everybody, posture, posture. It speaks to an internal reality with an external expression. It it speaks to um, the way of your heart and mind as it is aligned with the way and the heart of Jesus. And we want to grow in our posture. And we're going to be tested in this. There's a lot of things on the big scale that will test us. We have another election Um, this year, which is just one of 64 taking place around the the world. I mentioned that last week. There have been five elections around the world already, and there's turbulence that's entering into the world because of elections. I'm not sure, but we get, you know, discombobulated during an election cycle, and that's before us. But it also happens in the simple ways, too. After I preached the message on posture last week, that word was front and center in my mind, and I would be challenged with my posture on the very first day, and I just preached it, so I felt an accountability to God, to you you and to myself because I just preached it. But I, after the service, left a couple hours later and went to the airport because I was going to a leadership conference in Florida. I get to the airport. Everything's fine. Get on the plane. Everything's fine. We're getting ready to leave the gateway, but we can't quite leave because catering hasn't arrived. And catering brings food. There's no food on the plane. I've never been on a plane with, there's no peanuts, nothing. I mean, water is what there is. And the pilot says their truck broke down. They're on their way. Should be about 15 minutes. An hour later, he comes back on and he says, um, They are not responding to us. They're not here yet. He was clearly agitated. His posture with all of the passengers wasn't exactly exemplary. Let me just say that the pilot was not in a good place himself. He said, we are considering just getting up and leaving without food. Of course, many people paid for that food. I didn't care. I go, let's go. Let's get there, right? No, he felt we should wait. And we did another hour, two hours on the tarmac waiting for a couple of cookies. (laughs) I'm not in first class. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and maybe a Coke or something like that. But that, that's what you're waiting for. I could, we could have been in our destination by now. And so my posture matters. Remember what I said? We're going to do a spiritual square dance this year. And it's about posture because when you do a square dance, it begins with a bow or a nod. Whether you want to dance with that person or not, you start with respect. That 
leads to the lead step and the lead step matters and the lead step is mercy and grace. And mercy and grace in that lead step opens up the second step to the dance which allows fluidity in the dance and that's grace and our truth along the way. So grace and truth happen in that spiritual square dance. We'll come back to that over the course of the year. But I was challenged already in this flight but finally we got up, I go good. I like to work on the plane, I'm working. It's a very productive flight. We land and we're landing in Orlando, Florida which is the land of Disney. Kids everywhere, I love children, I really do. But they're everywhere, they're everywhere. It's a zoo and it's late at night because we're way delayed in our flight. So I go down to my rental car and wait an hour and 15 minutes for my rental car in line because the flights came in late, they only had two agents and I'm battling posture. I just preached on it, Joel, God is watching. People are looking at your face, it truly matters. And I got through that line, I was gracious, I was kind, and I finally got my car, and I made my way, I had to drive nearly two hours north to my site. I got there at 1 a.m., and I will just tell you, I was tired and angry. And when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, your most susceptible temptation in your posture falters. And so I had to have that word. Oh man, keeping the word posture really helped me on that day. That's in the little stuff more or less the big stuff. I think posture is a great word for us in the course of the year. And to help us, we have a theme verse to undergird it. It's Colossians 1.17. Say it with me. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Giving thanks. One of the things I said last week, Paul just populates each portion of the letter with a spirit of thankfulness. He's teaching them to be a thankful people. A posture of gratitude really is important. Thanksgiving that evolves into thanks living and is evidenced by the words that you speak and how you speak them and the deeds that you do and how you do them all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that a great anchoring text for us for 2024? I think God will use it to make a difference. Okay, let's jump into today's passage, if we may. Paul wrote this letter again from um, prison in Ephesus. He had never been to Colossae. He didn't start the church there. Epaphras started the church. Epaphras was a disciple. He had come to faith in Christ through the apostle Paul. And here, he's, his life is so transformed <laughs> He's been rescued from his old life. He's transformed. He's been welcomed into the family of God. He's going from village to village. He's sharing the gospel. He's planting churches. He's giving us this beautiful example. Paul's never been there, but he writes the letter because he hears that this is a church on the move, that God is at work, and that this church is alive. And so last week we looked at they were alive because of their faith in Jesus Christ. It was authentic and real that they were alive because of this incredible posture they had of love toward people, because of a hope that was just evidence and dwelling within and just effusing out from their very being, and because they were a people who demonstrated um, fruit. There was a fruit that caused the gospel to spread from the joy of these people, and Paul wanted to thank them for this faith that was so alive. But they're two years old now, and the honeymoon is over, and now there's uh, some feuding starting to enter into their relationship because there's confusion, and the confusion relates to the question, who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And so that confusion started to seep in through cultural influences and false teachers to the end that it created some disagreement, even some division along the way. And it related to this reality of Jesus which eventually diminished the joy and the aliveness of some of those Christ followers. And Paul wants them to stay alive because God is at work in them. This is sound familiar to today's culture by chance in any ways, that there's quick disagreement and division that happens. And we wanna be mindful of that. We wanna have proper posture. We know that that's a reality in life and in journey. And so he calls them into this given place. They're confused about who this Jesus is. There's this feud that starts to happen. I started to think about it as I'm preparing and I go, for whatever reason, what pops into my head is the old game show Family Feud that is still the new game show with Steve Harvey. You know that game? The survey says, da-da-da-da. So they do this sample survey with, you know how many people? A hundred people. Just a hundred people. And then they put up the survey and give the answers and some of those answers are so stupid but it's only a hundred people. You got to understand where do they come up with that deal? It's only a hundred people. 
And this is what stuck in my mind. What if you had a sample survey that wasn't 100 but billions? What if there was a heavenly survey that took into consideration the voice of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, of thousands upon thousands of angels in the heavenly realm, of a cloud of witnesses of those who have gone before us from one generation to the other generation in the history of the church that are in the heavenly realm today, or the apostles, or your loved ones, my mom, my, my grandmother, a great um, father, a follower of Christ Jesus, if they all participated in a heavenly survey, we would have billions of billions of people and a whole different outcome. So we're gonna play Family Feud. <laughs> in a text that is really a lofty text, but when you put it in this way, it might be helpful to understand what it is we are being called to. In fact, in Colossians 1, 15 through 23, our verses today, I think Paul is saying, don't let the cultural influences, don't let the false teachers confuse you or lose your faith because he is still at work in you and for you and through you. Keep it alive is what he's saying. So he's elevating from a heavenly survey point what you can be confident in. You ready to play the game? So who is Jesus? The heavenly expression, the heavenly sample, the first one is that he is creator. That he is uh, not just creator, but he is a creator with the whole sample saying it's 100%. You know, sometimes the answer goes up, all well, 30% said this is the number one answer. The number one answer in Paul's part of the letter is creator. And the earthly answer is that he is man. And that's the reality of what they were dealing with. That in the earthly perspective, people started to see these Christ followers and say, who is this Jesus? Because you're saying that he is a creator and he, he may have been a good guy. He walked around from village to village, he did really good things. He was a great teacher, but creator, no way. You're saying that he comes into the flesh and that he goes to the cross and he dies for sin in order to bring us into the family of God, to, to be in the presence of a relational God, he goes, no way, that can't be the case. That is just not possible. And so then Paul begins to elevate from the heavenly survey what our billions would say, that he is creator. We find it in verses 15 through 16. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things. All things have been created through him and for him. So the heavenly survey says he is creator. I have emphasized this through the course of the years, the G-O-E, that God is over everything, that everything comes from God, everything belongs to God, Everything is ruled by God and everything is returned to God. And we, we learn in this given text and throughout the scriptures that Jesus is the one who comes alongside and is the agent of that change. In Genesis 1, we read that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in between and said it was good. But we're also told that Jesus was the creator of that good that he is the creator, the originator, that he indeed is the one who comes to architect and design everything exists because of who Jesus is. So we read in the scriptures that the mountains declare the glory of God through the work of Jesus. So when we see mountains, they speak to us in a special way because of what Jesus has created for us. The mountains declare the glory of God. And I think you know that's to be true. When we took our first ever family vacation to the mountains this past summer, and we were in the lower part of the, the mountain on the west side, and one of our family members one afternoon took a hike late afternoon to the top of the crown of the mountain onto the east side where the sun would be setting. And my, we, we decided to go up there every time because you know what we saw? We saw, wow, take a look at this video. This is from my daughter and we saw a field with beautiful flowers and the mountains declaring the glory of God and a fox went by and a deer went by. So every evening we went to this crown to watch the sun set. My daughter put this on Instagram with the sound of music playing behind it but I don't have copyright for that so you don't get the sound of music but the hills are alive. They speak to us because the mountains declare the glory of God and the creative agent to create those mountains is Jesus himself. And the stars reveal what for us? The vision of God. 
And the, the work of Jesus creates for us the stars and a promise that comes with that vision for relationship. I mean, when you think about looking at stars, they speak to us, don't they? Do you remember the first time you looked into the heavenlies and you saw the stars and you go like, wow. Yeah, I was a young boy. I was in South Minneapolis, Powderhorn Park, going on to toboggan down the hill at Powderhorn Park. And I get up there and I lay down and I, even in the city, the stars were brilliant that night. And I was taken, boggled, like, where did they come from? How does that work? In a young boy's mind, you know how it is. It just captures your attention. Well, if you look at what we're learning today, it's extraordinary. The James Webb Space Telescope has given us um, the clearest and the deepest image of the universe. And uh, here's an image, most recent, um, of the sophisticated nature of the universe. If they believe that there is between 100 to 200 billion galaxies in this universe. And the galaxy that is closest to us, of course, is we, we're under the hovering galaxy known as the Milky Way. And they believe that within the Milky Way, there are 100 billion stars just in the Milky Way. Now, we see the stars, and they speak to us in a powerful way. But we're reminded that Jesus is the creator, and that he is the originator, and he is the architect, and he is the designer of those stars. But they are connected very much to the relationship that God envisioned for us. So you read in Genesis twenty-two seventeen, I will surely bless you and make your descendants more um, prosperous or more in number, multiply them than the, the stars in the sky. It's that picture of God connecting um, the billions of people who will fall under that beautiful relationship that we would have in him. Or in John 1.1, 1, 1, a verse that many people know, and it takes this Greek word logos, and in the English it translated it as word, and the word is the picture of Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, with God, and the word was God. But William Isaacs in his commentary says, really, uh, the etymology of that word isn't best translated um, word. It's best translated relationship. In the beginning was the relationship. And the relationship was with God. And the relationship was God. You get the intimacy of God's creative power in the cosmos, but his vision and his intent of his creative power with us and our relationship with him. And so in Colossians 1.15, our verse for the day, it says the Son is the image of the invisible God, that we are created in the image of God himself um, for a relationship with God. And we find the affirmation throughout the scriptures, like in Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. So we have this relationship from the very beginning he knew about us coming, and when we were born, he set us apart from it. We were with some friends recently whose daughter is pregnant, and you know, you're proud when you're in that way, so they pull out their phone. You wanna see a picture? And they had a 3D ultrasound of the baby, and they showed it to us, and I was blown away. This is the ultrasound of their baby. This is 22 and a half weeks. And I'm thinking, we didn't have ultrasounds like this. Anybody else agree? I mean, our ultrasounds were not much more than a blob. And here you see this defined form. It's just reminded of this life-giving God who has a vision for us to have a relationship with him. I just want to say, we have special guests on our campuses at Bush Lake today, West Tonka, and here from New Life Family Services. And they exist to honor God, first and foremost. And they seek to do that by coming along side of women who are pregnant and are contemplating, what do I do with this life? And they're, they're really hard decisions. You know what they do? They take a posture of love and compassion. And they sit, they try to understand the story, try to bring life-giving counsel to these young women. So we come along from the beginning of the church and we volunteer. So at Bush Lake specifically, you have made that a priority of your volunteering over there. Great for you. Um, we have financially supported them from the beginning. We just recently invested into the opening of a clinic in the Phillips neighborhood that would come alongside and provide resources for appointments and ultrasounds like you just saw here to help them make good decisions. So they're at our sites, at all of our sites today. It's Sanctity of Life um, Sunday that we're celebrating. So I just want to encourage you to stop by. 
Thank them for the good work that they do, coming alongside of women, making hard decisions. And thank them for that work, but you might want to volunteer as well and just make yourself available to the end that God would prompt you. So coming back to what Paul says, why does it matter that Jesus is the creator? It matters because in the Colossians passage we have, it says, by Jesus, all things were created through him and for him. It matters because we ask those essential questions. Um, who am I? Well, I am a child of God loved by him. So I'm reminded I have value and worth. That's how important it is to know that he created you. And that all things are created for him. It reminds us to answer that existential question, why am I here? For him. To know him and worship him and love him, to serve him, to be with him and he with me. I have a purpose. The purpose is found in our creator. That's the anchor to this part of the passage and such a powerful anchor it is. It leads us to um, the survey says, number two, the heavenly survey especially, um, that he is sustainer, that he holds all things together. And in the billions who take that sample, there's 100% agreement that Jesus Christ is the sustainer holding it all together. The earthly view is different. It's God's. It's God's holding all things together. And how true it is. It's a dangerous thing if you come into a village and say that you follow Jesus Christ because every town has its ancient gods, its local gods, its Greek gods. And it's these gods who bring safety, who hold things together for the village. I referenced this in December when we were in Togo and we saw the work of voodoo alive and well in Togo, West Africa. And the villages have these idols in front of the gateway to the villages that they are residents of that village as much as people in the flesh and blood are residents. And it is these gods who hold things together. It is their sustainer. And you find that there is this reality in these villages. There's a chief or a priest who has been given the responsibility if something bad happens, if there's an earthquake, if there's a flood, if there's a disease, that maybe we're not worshiping our gods properly or keeping the festivals or making our sacrifices right. And it's that person's job, the chief's job, to say this is why, and they find someone to blame. And then somebody is usually sacrificed so they can be cleansed and they can be held together in new ways. Those practices are still alive today. It's not just in the ancient text that we find it, but this is what they're dealing with. And then you also find that there were Greek sophists who existed in the community because Greek culture brought the wisdom that came from humanity, that that wisdom is elevated among, above all wisdom. They were atheists and relativists in nature, but they also would respect the gods of villages, but they didn't believe in those gods, but they they practiced a wisdom they thought was the wisdom that you needed to hold things together. So when Epiphras comes into the village and communicates that there is another God, a one true God, the God who is the father to this guy, this man by Jesus, um, it creates a lot of turbulence because he also communicates to those who come to faith in Jesus no longer worship these little G gods. Worship the one and only living God. And as a result of that, there's a lot of violence and challenge and trouble that comes to them. And they're reminded back into that question, who is Jesus? And Paul is saying, don't lose, don't let these cultural influences, don't let these false teachers take you away from the life that you have. This is what it says in verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's in him all things hold together. So Jesus is the sustainer of everything. It is his wisdom that is needed for our lives to be able to see things held together. Now, many people say of Christians that we are so exclusive, but can I just clarify this? This is helpful for me in thinking about these things because some of these gods, some of these sophists, these Greek folks, they had a wisdom that was good wisdom. It was a good wisdom because they're under common grace. So like my mom, my mom taught me how to love God before my mom loved God herself. That is, there are people who are under common grace. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> I love two-year-olds. It's great. So <laughs> she's, she wants to be in touch with the creator of God. I'm going to show her the way. Um, but we, we have this wisdom. My mom taught me the love of God because there are people. Have you ever had this thought that I, I have people in my life who don't believe in Jesus Christ, 
but they love people better than some Christians that I know. How can that be? Because all love that is true love is God's love. And under common grace, everybody gets that. Same with wisdom. Everybody has access. There's good wisdom that comes from others. Don't discount the fact that there's no wisdom in other gods and religions. No, there is good wisdom, but we are called to come into this one who holds it all together. They're encompassed into this God of wisdom revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And that's the picture. And why does it matter? Because Jesus didn't just create us and he didn't just order us and... Um, come along and architect us and design us and then leave us. He didn't just abandon us. He, he didn't just take off. No, our God is with us and for us and not against us. He sees us and he hears us and with his mighty right hand, he guides us. That he is a sustainer of a universe when you feel like, oh, the earth is just gonna blow up and fall apart. No, it's not. No, it's not. He is the sustainer. He holds it all together. It keeps fear from taking root in your soul. When you feel like, oh, my life is just falling apart. No, it's not. You just feel like it's falling apart. He holds it together. Trust in him. And that's why Paul, uh, Peter says, uh, in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, we find these beautiful words. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and with his mighty hand, he will lift you up. He will hold you. He will keep you together. Cast all your cares and anxieties on him because he cares for you. Show me a God who cares for you like this God doesn't exist. And that's what Paul is reminding them, keep your faith alive, be in this given place. It truly does matter. Let's go back to the heavenly survey because I know you love this game. <laughs> Here's the third. The heavenly survey says, who is Jesus? He's a leader. He is supreme leader. And if you take the billions in the sample, there's not a doubt or a question. He is supreme. He is Lord of lords, king of kings, prince of all princes. At the earthly realm, it says Rome. Rome, because the first emperor was called Lord, and Lord meant master, supreme leader, head over the nation, the village, etc. So you can worship your ancient gods and your Greek sophists can all be part of this dynamic, but you must bow to the Roman emperor of that given time and place. And it's an important expression because against this backdrop of the Greco-Roman politics and religion, um, we have Epaphras coming in to say, no, Jesus is Lord, he is master. So you don't worship these other gods, you worship him alone. And Tacitus, the great church historian, uh, or the historian who said that when Christians refused to bow before Caesar as Lord, they, were, they would face cruel punishment. I got a text yesterday, I can't share any detail, but it rocked me, it did. Three of our key um, partners and evangelists in Myanmar were killed in the last 10 weeks because of the gospel. These tensions still exist today. And we're in prayer for them. And we're prayer for us. Because these Christ followers, I mean, they are so alive. I've been able to visit them, be with them, and they just inspire my faith, our faith, and all that we do in this given place. And so we find in Colossians 1.18 this reminder. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy he has supreme voice in your life. He is the supreme leader of your life. He will keep your life alive and well. And I love the reminder, he is the head of the body, the church. And so that's an important call for us, that Jesus is the creator and the originator and the architect and the designer of the church. And so have a high view of church because he birthed it. So when we say we get to be the church, it's not a have to, it's a get to. It, it, it was Jesus who birthed it for a purpose. He ordained the church to be the means to make his name and his goodness known. He does it through you and me. I don't, I don't get it all. But that was his choice to move in that given direction. And that matters to us, doesn't it? Because we live in a time where people say, I'll deal with Jesus okay, but man, the church, I want nothing to do with it. That's our time and place. But we can't separate those two things. Yeah, the church doesn't work right all the time. Yeah, we don't get the love thing right all the time. But the church is birthed by Jesus. He created it. And we would dishonor him if we have nothing to do with the church because we do. We're connected together. There's one head to the church, and you know who it is. It's Jesus Christ. It is not the Pope. It is not Joel. It is not 
um, our campus pastors. It, it just isn't. It's Jesus Christ, which makes all of us body parts, pretty cool body parts. Some are visible and seen, some are not, but they matter and we must swim together in this body. We must be united together for the head to bring us together for the purposes in full that he has for us. And may that be our case. So who is the head of your life? Who is that during my leadership event that I was at this past week? I was in the marketplace. And I love these invitations to be with people who may or may not have faith. And I get to be an ambassador in subtle and kind ways with the right posture in those places. The plenary speaker came out of the John Maxwell group and his first question was, who is the leader in your life who has shaped your life in leadership um, to this day? And then he had to sit around the table and talk about who that person is and was. And, and then he came back and he said, what is it that you learned from that leader that's still alive in you today? But then he asked the question, is that person the leader of influence in you because of what you learned from them or felt from them? And I thought that is an interesting way to put it. The person I identified was James Conner. I've spoken about him before. When I was 14 years old, he was my lit teacher. And he, uh, he taught medieval history to ninth graders. And he had a ruler. And he would walk around the classroom and he slapped the desks with the ruler when he was going through. He just had a passion for medieval history and kind of, you know, kept you awake. And he was an amazing teacher. And he taught me not only words and a love for literature, which was born in me at 14 years of age, but he also taught me how to drive. He took interest in other uh, young guys who had come from single families and he invested in them. And he taught me how to play chess. He just taught me a lot. But what he made me feel motivated my learning all the more. After I graduated from ninth grade, went to high school, um, he went to Europe. And when he was in Europe, he bought four of us guys a special gift. And I got this wallet that he purchased in Italy. And I keep it in my front desk. And in it was a letter. It wasn't a simple note by any means. It was a four-page letter. And I keep it there, and I read these words, and they speak to me powerfully, to say the least. And he speaks about um, the relationship that he has with students, and he confesses that he's reached the old age of 30. <laughs> Honestly, when you're 14, I thought he was 80. <laughs> He, he thinks about the fact that he may not be married and have children, which, by the way, I'm still in touch with him, and he's not married, and he doesn't have children. But he goes in this descriptive picture, and I'm not going to read the detail of it, but he talks about sitting on a cliff. They were in Greece, and he was writing this letter on this cliff, looking at the sheep below this beautiful setting, and he reflects, and he says, you know, if I was to have a child, and I could have a son, I'd want a son like you. And I read that, and I go... As a 14-year-old kid, how I felt in that really matters. And you know that's true for you. We learn the will and the way of the Lord, and it's marvelous. But when you learn that you are loved by the creator, the originator, the architect, the designer, something happens in here that is just extraordinary. That's why it matters. Who is this Jesus? One last one, and briefly before we go. And that is, um, if I could go back to the survey, reconciler, who is Jesus? 100% of the survey would say, he's a reconciler, but the earthly response would be, me, me. That we think that we're reconciled to God by who we are, the good we do, how kind we are. Certainly God would welcome me into a relationship like we detach and we make it about us, but it's all about him and his grace and his mercy. He does the reconciling work that brings us into his presence. And how important is that? We learn in the next verse. For God, who is pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He is the peacemaker. Would you like to have peace in your life? Would you like to have peace in the world? He's the creator of the peace that makes that happen. No one can make that peace happen the way he does. 
So he is the reconciler. He does the work of shedding his blood on the cross to make the way so we can have a right relationship with God. But that's not all. He makes us ambassadors of reconciliation. And that's why Paul reminds us, as much as it is possible and as it depends on you, live at peace with each other. Friends, when we have conflict, we don't just get to leave it. We need to reconcile it because of what Christ has done for us. I was part of a racial healing experience these last uh, couple of days at our Bush Lake site. And uh, we have eight churches for Four um, black churches, four white churches, we're coming together to advance the goodness of our reconciled. We're, we know that we've been reconciled by, in Jesus Christ, but we don't live that reconciliation out very well. We're learning how to do that better with each other. One of the black church leaders says, I've got a word for us. And he made up the word. It is a good word. Here's the word. All us we. Say it. All us we. It's not me, myself, and I, the world around. It's all us we reconciled by Jesus Christ. I love this new word. You will hear it again. <laughs> let us be all us we because of who Jesus Christ made us to be and let him lead us in the journey because we stand before Jesus and who is Jesus? He is creator, your creator. He is sustainer, the one who holds you together and the world in which we live. Um, he is this leader whose voice helps us know how to relate to him, how to understand self and how to relate to others, to how to see them and, and, and how to treat them and how to reach them. And friends, he is the reconciler. And there's no one else that can take that place. Thank God Almighty that Jesus is our reconciler. So with that said, would you stand and let's close together in prayer. Father, God, thank you for revealing to the Apostle Paul in prison these words spoken to this two-year-old church and to us today to remind us when there's confusion and feuds taking place concerning who this Jesus is, that there is a very large sample of evidence that says, oh no, this is Jesus, your son, who is your agent to create um, who is the one who has just ordered things in a beautiful way, architecting them, designing the world in which we live and us to live in it with you and each other in a way that would bring that love, the joy, and that peace that we most need. So we avail ourselves. We want to grow our faith in 2024. Guide our steps to your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name.